Thank you for joining us today at Connection Point. I want to give a shout out to our parents, teachers, and students. It's officially summer, and we are so proud of all of you. It's been a tough year, but with God's faithfulness, we are now able to take a moment and celebrate a time of rest and summer vacation. Whether this is one of your first times joining us this morning, or you've been with us a while, we are so glad that you're here. I want to take a minute to personally invite you to connect with us as we get started today. All you need to do is text the word CONNECT to the number on the screen and you'll receive a list of all the ways you can connect with us this weekend. One of those ways is our Next Steps class we offer on Sunday mornings at 9.15 a.m. in our building and Thursday evenings over Zoom. This is a great way for you to learn more about your faith and the unique gifts God has given you and will also help you plug into the community at Connection Point. Today, we are so excited to share that we're kicking off a new series based on Steve Poe's newly released book. His book is called Creatures of Habit, and we will be hearing from guest speaker Steve himself today on the topic of anger and each week discussing a different bad habit and how to replace them with God's desires for us. This book really captures the bad habits we find ourselves repeating and how to replace them with godly habits instead. We will be selling copies of Creatures of Habit in the lobby, and Steve will be sticking around to sign copies of his book today. So if you haven't already, be sure to grab your copy and meet us in the lobby after service today. Make sure you text the word CONNECT to 317-350-1996 to learn more about how to take your next steps at Connection Point and learn about our new series starting today. Parents, don't forget we have a special on-demand worship experience for your kids, birth through elementary. You can head to connectionpoint.org forward slash kids online to watch these services at any time. We also have a special middle school and high school service experience online. Head to connectionpoint.org forward slash students online to check out this weekly teaching. One more thing before we get started, we have a time of communion for you at the end of our service today. You can stay tuned at the end of our service for communion, or you can access this on-demand communion experience in our weekly Saturday email. Grab some crackers and juice and make sure you take advantage of this meaningful experience. Thank you for joining us this weekend. Let's get ready to worship. You guys ready to worship? Welcome to church, everyone. It's so good to that we get to worship together. Let's sing out. We've got so much to be grateful for. Our King is here with us. He's overcome the grave and we are alive. We've got breath in our lungs. Sing out. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain move. Sing out together. So when I fight, fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Jesus 
shadows, you win every battle. Yes, you do, Lord. Nothing can stand against the power of God. Let's sing it. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle.
summer. I'm so proud of you guys for choosing to seek God with us this weekend. And we've got a number of things to celebrate really quickly before we get into the Word of God. The first is we want to celebrate our graduating high school seniors. Way to go, high school seniors. Next weekend, we're going to have a video montage. We've got seniors from all sorts of area high schools, and we have a vision and a calling as a church to raise the strongest generation spiritually. High school seniors, we are so proud of you. Well, we spent the month of May unpacking that vision about the next generation, about making disciples in central Indiana, about amplifying Jesus online and through our missionaries. As part of that vision series, we learned about a family in the church that was led by the Spirit of God to make a matching donation of $500 thousand dollars what they said is everyone who gives a gift a new giver we will double that gift and they especially said we're praying for new reoccurring givers they said that giving regularly has so transformed their hearts and their lives that they want other people to experience this and they wrote us a letter they said if just one family would join us in regular recurring giving it would be worth this five hundred thousand dollars well church we've got a couple things to celebrate today the first is that not just one family joined but 100 122 of you signed up for regular recurring giving. Many of you new first-time givers. Church, would you guys just put your hands together and celebrate? Way to go, God. Way to go, church. Way to go, confetti. That's real confetti. That is not digital confetti, okay? Now get this. You might also be wondering, John, what about the 500,000? Did that get matched? We'll put your hands together again because yeah, the 500,000, the $500,000 didn't just get matched, it got exceeded. Now this is awesome because this allows us to do even more things with our missionaries and online and raising the next generation and being faithful right here. But even more than that, this is a spiritual step for those 122 people who signed up for regular recurring giving. Hey, I hope you know this summer, God is at work in our world. And I want you to go on vacations and catch your breath in life, but don't take a vacation from God. He's alive and active, and he's looking for people who will step out in bold faith so that he can work in our lives. Well, as I've been praying for you, one of the things that's been on my heart is our habits. During the season of COVID, a lot of us formed some bad habits or we dropped good habits. And so I'm so excited to introduce you to a new series called Creatures of Habit. Now, next week, I'll get to preach in this series. But this week, we've got the author of the book, Creatures of Habit. His name is Steve Poe. Steve is the lead pastor of Northview Church over in Carmel. And little piece of John trivia for you, eight years ago when I was pastoring in Arizona, Steve Poe flew me into Indianapolis to preach at his church in Carmel. And it was on that very trip that the Spirit of God started to call me and compel me. And I knew someday I'm going to move my family to central Indiana. And that's where I'm called to make disciples. So you guys can thank Steve for bringing me to Indiana, but here's what I know. Steve has always spoken the word of God to me as a leader. He has grown me and he has helped me in ways that I can't even summarize. And here's what I know. He's going to grow you and help you as you prepare to listen to the word of God today. So right now, would you open up your heart to God? Would you prepare to hear from God? And would you put your hands together and give Steve Poe a big connection point Welcome. Hey, Connection Point. I am so honored to be here with you guys today. I am so proud of this church and the accomplishments that you have made, not only in the city, but literally around the country that you've had for so many years. And of course, as you probably know, I love your pastor, John. We've known each other now for about eight years. I first met John when he was pastoring out in the Arizona area. In fact, about eight years ago, and I had him come and speak at our church. And of course, our people loved him, as you might imagine. And when he called and told me that he was going to be my next door neighbor, that he was coming to Indiana to Connection Point, I was so excited about that. I'm, not, I'm excited for you guys, and I'm excited for him as well. You guys know he's a great communicator, and he's just an incredible author. And one of the things that I really like about John is he's so focused with his vision. I mean, he just knows what God's called him to do, and he just goes after it. I absolutely love that. 
He and Mel are the real deal. They love God with all of their hearts, and I just, uh, I, I'm honored to be their friend. Well, I want to jump right into this, so let me pray, and we'll get started. Father, I just thank you, and I praise you for your faithfulness. You are an amazing God. I thank you for this incredible church and pray, dear God, that your blessings and your favor would continue to be upon Connection Point and that you would continue to use them in ways they never imagined possible. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are blessing them and ask that you would continue to bless them. And now, Lord, as we get into this new series today on Creatures of Habit, I pray that you would open up our our minds and our hearts, that you would open up our eyes and our ears to see and hear how you want to speak into our lives. Thanks, God. I love you and I praise you and I just ask that you would be with us now in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I grew up in a middle-class home with parents that absolutely loved me. And yet I had a father with a whole lot of unresolved anger. I never quite knew when he was going to blow or what might set him off. You know, it could be anything from a teenager driving down our road too fast and he'd run out of the house screaming and yelling at them, or maybe he's trying to sleep at night and I had the television a little bit too loud for him to fall asleep, and so he's coming out yelling. Whatever it was, when it happened, things got loud and the expletives began to fly. These these outbursts of anger created a whole lot of different emotions in me as a child. Everything from fear to embarrassment to making me angry over his anger. On one occasion, I was about 11, I think, and I don't know where we were going, but we were driving somewhere, and he started looking off to the side and didn't notice that the car in front of him had stopped, and so he rear-ended that car. Immediately, he turned to me and started screaming and yelling at me and said it was my fault because I didn't warn him. Something obviously had happened in my father's life long before he got in the car that day. And I don't mean minutes or hours before. I mean years before. Some injustice in his life that was totally unrelated to that fender bender. Some hurt or offense that was never resolved. So it left him responding to every perceived injustice with anger. Well, after a while... Anger became so much a part of his life that he didn't even notice the damage that it was doing to the people that he loved the most. Now, fortunately for me, the story ends on a much happier note because when I was a teenager, my dad stepped across the line of faith and made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of his life. And I mean, it radically changed him. From that time on, he went out of his way to make sure that I knew he was proud of me and that I knew that he loved me. And God became a priority for him. He got involved and active in the church and served in so many different capacities. Now, I'm I'm not trying to tell you that he never got angry again because certainly, like all of us, there are things that upset him. But I do believe that he broke that habit of responding to every difficult thing in his life with anger. We're talking about us being Creatures of habit, breaking the habits that are holding us back from God's best. And you guys are starting a series this weekend on that particular topic, which is based on a book that I have just written. All of my adult life, I I have been reading books on habits. I've been a big believer in the importance of habits. But it was just a few years ago that I began to wonder how much habits played into our spiritual growth And so I started doing some research, and I was surprised by how much habits played into our spiritual disciplines and into our spiritual growth. And so because of that, I decided to do a book on this. And I found that most of us, as I study this, I found that most of us underestimate the power of habits in our life. I know I certainly did. One of the things that I found is that psychologists and neurologists have done studies, and they found that over 40% of the things that we do every single day are done out of habit. I want you to wrap your brain around that. Almost half of everything you do during a day is done out of habit. Well, what is a habit? Well, a habit is a simple choice that we make that when it's repeated enough times, it becomes an unconscious pattern. So in other words, I decide to do something today Tomorrow, I make a decision to do the same thing. The next day, I decide to do it again. And before you know it, It's second nature. Before you know it, I'm just repeating an unconscious pattern. Those habits then become our identity. I want you to think about this. Those habits then become our identity or how people recognize us. 
We become known for our habits. Whether it's good or bad, we become known for our habits. Let me, let me give you an example of that. Let's say that um, I'm gonna, somebody's asking me about you, and I'm going to describe you to them. And you are an honest person, a person of integrity, but you do tend to worry a lot. So I'm going to describe you to this person. I'm going to say, well, you know, they are, they're, they're as honest as the day is long. They're a person of integrity. You can trust them. But at the same time, they do tend to worry quite a bit. So you see what I've done? I've just described you by your habits. And that's what we do. We describe one another by our habits. And that, my friends, is why it's so important that we establish good habits. Okay, so then how in the world do we know if it's a good habit or if it's a bad habit? Well, that's a great question because our brains cannot delineate between the two. Our brain has no idea if it's a good habit or a bad habit. So what is a good habit? A good habit is anything that reinforces your desire to be like Christ. As Christians, our responsibility is to grow in the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. Our responsibility is to take on his nature. So we want to establish habits that help us to take on his nature. The Bible calls those spiritual disciplines. See, again, Scripture has a lot to say about habits. It calls them spiritual disciplines. And those spiritual disciplines become our good habits, and those things become the stepping stones in our life. In other words, those are the things that will help us take on the nature of Christ or take on his image. On the other hand, bad habits. Bad habits are those things that conflict with who Christ wants us to be. They conflict with us taking on the nature of Christ. The scripture calls those spiritual strongholds. Now, a spiritual stronghold is that, is that thing that gets a grip on us, it gets a hold on us, and it keeps us from God's best. Those are also known as addictions. And those are the things that become tombstones in our life. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that those are the things that kind of are the death of a vision. Those are the things that kind of keep us from God's purpose or from God's plan. Now, as I said to you a a few moments ago, that um, there's a lot about habits in Scripture. And I could spend a lot of time talking about that, but there's one passage that I want to point out to you, and that would be in Romans chapter 12, the second verse. Notice this. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Now, do you remember what I said about habits? I said, habits are an unconscious pattern. So do not conform to the pattern or to the habits of this world, but instead be transformed, be changed. How? By the renewing of your mind. So if you have this unconscious pattern and you need to break it in your life, how are you going to do that? You're going to do it by renewing your mind, by creating a good habit in its place, breaking an old habit, creating a new habit. Listen, before you invited Jesus Christ into your life, sin had a grip on you. Sin had a hold on you. And then when you invited Jesus Christ to come into your life, the Bible tells us that we've been given the power to say no to sin. That grip, that hold was broken, and we can say no to sin. And yet, I can't tell you how many times over the years that people have come to me and they said, Steve, I've been a Christian now for five years. And I still feel stuck. I still feel like I'm not getting anywhere. Or maybe somebody say, I've been a believer for 10 years and I don't feel like I'm growing in my faith. And the reason is, is because of habits. And so even though you have the power to say no to sin, you still have all of these habits that have been established in your life over many, many years. And they're not just going to go away because you invited Christ into your life. You have to be intentional to say, I'm going to take the necessary steps so that I can break these bad habits and create good habits. Guys, you didn't form these habits overnight. You're not going to get rid of them overnight. They say it takes anywhere from 21 to 30 days to establish a habit in our life. So you have to begin the process somewhere if you're serious about growing in Christ. Well, today we're going to talk about, and again, but let me, let me just say before I move into this, that's why I believe that this book, Creatures of Habit, you know, I know I'm, I'm, I'm uh, prejudiced on this and I, and I really believe in this book, but at the same time, I really do believe this book will be helpful to you because I think it's timeless in the sense that uh, maybe three years from now, you're struggling with worry and you're not quite sure what to do. And you can go back to the chapter on worry and it gives you the steps that you can take 
or maybe you're struggling with uh, lust or complaining, you can go to those specific chapters and it'll give you the steps you need to take. It's a great, it's a great Bible study for men and women uh, and it's great for a new believer, for a new Christian. So I would encourage you to get a copy and I'll be out front to sign later. Today we're gonna talk about the habit of anger. But I first think it's important to mention that anger is not always a bad thing. In fact, anger is a God-given emotion. It's when it becomes a habit or the way we automatically respond to things that we don't like. That's when it becomes a problem. So in other words, I, I respond to someone angrily. The next day, I respond to someone else, else with an angry emotion. And then before I know it, it just becomes second nature. It just becomes a, a, an unconscious pattern. And I don't even know why I'm getting mad. I'm just responding. Haven't you ever had a person in your life where you said, man, they're just an angry person? I, I don't know what they're angry about, but they're just an angry person. What's happened is that they've created the habit of anger in their life. And so anger is designed to help us deal with any threat that might come into our life. You see, anger becomes a problem when you lose control. When you lose control of your words or when you lose control of your actions. For instance, we know Jesus got angry. Do you remember, do you remember the story when he ran the money changers out of the temple? The merchants were turning religion into a money-making scam, and it angered him. And I think, of course, if we took the time, there are other places in Scripture and other things in Scripture that angered Jesus. We certainly know that any kind of injustice angers God. I think it angers God to see an adult harm a child. And yet, even though Jesus got angry, the scripture says what? The scripture says he never sinned. You see, the type of anger that Jesus demonstrated really was more of a righteous indignation. He got angry at those who acted contrary to God's standard of fairness and justice and goodness. This anger is more directed at the wrong that was done and not so much towards the person involved. In fact, guys, it's this kind of anger that's produced great movements across the country. Movements such as MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Their anger over the loss of their children motivated them to do something about it by starting one of the largest victim advocate groups in America today. On the other hand, anger is an emotion that many of us experience when the things in our world are just not going the way we want. Maybe you've been working towards a promotion, but it goes to someone else. Man, that makes you angry. Or you tell your kids to go clean their room, but they totally ignore you. That makes you so mad. As I said, if anger becomes your immediate response every time you don't like the way something is working or something is happening, then you, established, you have established a habit of anger. And it has the potential to hurt your health, to wreck your peace of mind, and to destroy your relationships, and even to threaten your career. I can't tell you how many jobs my dad lost when he was such an angry individual. Several years ago, uh, I brought in psychologist and author Dr. Richard Dobbins to speak to a group of men. And I remember this vividly as he stood in front of those guys and he said, men, there are three things that we struggle with. Three things that men struggle with. Number one is anger issues. Number two is sexual issues. And number three, we lie about the first two. Anger has become an epidemic in America today. You see signs of our nation's irritability everywhere you go. The polarization of the political system, the everyday nastiness of social media. And then in the last 18 months, this whole cancel culture that's been established. Or even worse yet is the workplace or school shootings. Guys, it's gotten so bad that we're afraid to lock eyes with anyone in fear that they might pull out a gun and shoot us. And yet most, most violence is not random. The American SPCC says there's over 4 million child abuse cases reported every single year. Think about that. Over 4 million child abuse cases reported every single year. And that's just the ones reported and many of those by angry, out-of-control parents. Friends, no one is born with anger issues. It's all learned behavior, which is why, hear me, if you are a parent, you need to control your anger in front of your kids. Psychologists have called our generation the age of rage. 
it's become so common, we've created our own rage vocabulary. For instance, road rage. I mean, it's a term that all of us recognize and possibly have experienced. Or maybe you've experienced checkout rage while waiting in a long line at a retail store. Or phone rage after being put on hold for a long time. Or even we see it in recreational activities such as golf rage. I remember several years ago I was golfing with some buddies and uh, one of the guys was just having a really, really bad day and he did a terrible shot. He finally got so angry that he took his club and he threw it into the pond. Then he got in the cart and he drove off. It was awkward. The rest of us got in the cart and we followed on to the next hole. He didn't say anything and finally about two holes later he calmed down enough. He got back in the cart, drove back to that pond and he waded into that murky water and he found his club. Listen, Proverbs chapter 14, 29 says, people with understanding control their anger. A hot temper shows great foolishness. Some of you might argue that you can't control your temper. Some of you'd say, Steve, I want to, but I can't control my anger. And I would simply push back and say, while you might not be able to control the situation, or you might not be able to control how it makes you feel, you certainly can control how you express your anger. It also reminds me of a story I read several years ago of an outdoor passion play and the actor that played Jesus. And he was walking up the hill and he's carrying his cross on his shoulders. And there was a heckler off to the side. And this heckler was so obnoxious and he's yelling at him and he's cursing at him. And finally, this guy that's playing Jesus gets so angry that he puts down the cross. He goes over to him and he punches him in the face. He then comes back, and he picks up his cross, and he continues on. Well, after the play was over, the director came up, and he said, man, what are you doing? He said, I know that guy was a pain, but I can't have my actors going and getting violent or punching spectators. He said, especially the one playing Jesus. He said, I'm so sorry. I don't know what got into me. I'll never let that happen again. So he said, all right, don't let it happen again. So day two, he's out there carrying his cross up the hill. And this heckler is back, and he's being obnoxious again. The guy finally loses his temper. He puts down the cross. He goes over, and he punches him in the nose. Comes back, picks up the cross, and on he goes. Well, of course, afterwards, the director says, that's it. You're fired. I can't, I can't have Jesus hitting people in the crowds. And so the guy pleaded with him. He said, please, I need this job, and it'll hurt my reputation. Just give me one more chance. I promise I'll control my temper. And he said, okay, I'm going to give you one more opportunity. But he said, if you, if you do anything like that again, we're not even going to talk. You're done. Just get your things and leave. So here they are the third day. And he's walking up the hill with the cross, the same place that heckler's out there again. He's cursing at him. He's shouting at him. And this guy that's playing Jesus is getting so upset. He's grinding his teeth. He's, he's clenching his fist. And he finally stops. And he turns and he points at this guy and he said, I'll meet you after the resurrection. Listen, when we don't control our anger, we don't seem much like Jesus, do we? Some try to use anger to motivate people to action. Maybe you yell at your kids to motivate their behavior. Or you yell at the, the sales clerk to motivate her to help you. Or you yell at your employees to motivate them to work harder. And you know what? It works at least in the short term. You can scare people into doing almost anything, but in the long run, friends, you are always going to lose because anger always alienates people. Think about it. When people are angry and shouting at you, does it endear you to them? Does it draw you closer to them? No, it pushes you away, doesn't it? You don't want any part of them. Immediately, your spirit closes down. Well, if you're a parent and you're using anger to motivate your kids, I'm just telling you, moms and dads, you're actually pushing them away from you. Listen, when your kids were young, they think you're a superhero. I mean, everyone else might think you're a bit quirky or maybe even a bit odd, but not your kids. They think you can do no wrong. Their spirit is actually wide open to you. But if you continue to show anger towards them, it'll close their spirits. So here you have your kids. They love their parents. They believe the best about their parents. Their spirits are wide open. But the more you get angry with them, the more their little spirits will close down. And from that point, once you close their spirits, you can love on them. You can say kind things to them. But you've closed their spirits. 
And the same thing happens actually with anyone that we constantly show anger to. Paul recognized the danger of that when he warned us in Ephesians chapter 6. He said, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with a discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Listen to me, friends. If you struggle with the habit of anger, you may feel like there's nothing you can do, but you have more control over your anger than you might realize. You can learn to express your emotions without losing control. So today, today I want to give you some steps that you can take or some steps that you can use to break this habit of anger in your life. But guys, can I just say this before I jump into it? If it doesn't work, in other words, if you, if you take these steps that I'm going to give you and you put them into practice, but it doesn't break the habit of anger, then can I just encourage you to get professional help? Seriously. Because guys, if you continue to ignore this habit of anger in your life, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt the relationships you have with the people you care the most about. And so if these steps don't work for you, then by all means, find a counselor who has experience with anger issues. You don't want to hurt the people that you love. You know, we often try to excuse our behavior by blaming other people for our anger, don't we? You know what, it's, it's those kids of mine that make me so mad. My coworkers, they make me so angry. If she wouldn't have said that, I wouldn't have lost my temper. Listen, before you can ever break this habit of anger, you have to own it. You have to, you have to take responsibility you, you can't work these steps until you first raise a hand and say, okay, I get it. This is a problem for me, and I need to deal with it. For instance, in this book, I have 12 chapters or 12 topics. And you say, how'd you come up with these particular topics? I literally, when I was doing research, I made a list of about 35 to 40 bad habits that, that, are, that are spiritual strongholds. And I looked at those habits, and I picked out the 12 that I struggle with. I picked out the 12 that have been a problem for me in my life, and those are the 12 I thought, you know, I know these. I've worked with these, and so those are the 12 I picked out. And I'm able to deal with them in my life because I first acknowledged it, because I first own it. Some of them I've completely been able to get out of my life. Others, with, others I still struggle with. But I've battled with every one of them. But before we can get started, you have to acknowledge it's a problem. So once you've acknowledged it's a problem, here's some steps. I want to briefly give you some steps that you can deal with. The book goes into more detail. But number one, identify the source of your anger. Identify the source of your anger. If you have a habit of losing control over every perceived injustice, then you need to figure out what's really behind your anger. Because anger, listen guys, anger is rarely the primary problem. In other words, it's usually the result of a much deeper problem, such as pride or hurt or insecurity or embarrassment. But you see, once I understand what's behind my anger, then I'm more likely to resolve it. For example, physical or emotional pain can cause anger. Now, when I was young, really the decade of my 30s, I went through some unexplained joint and muscle pain. I don't mean just sore muscles or sore joints. I mean to the extreme to the point that it was uh, keeping me from working at times. I went to several doctors. Some said it was fibromyalgia. Some claimed it was other things. No one truly figured it out. All I knew is that I was in a lot of pain, a lot of unexplained pain. And I found that when I was having my bad days, when I hurt the most, I was impatient with people and I was quick to lose my temper. And if people didn't understand what was underneath all of that, they would obviously be offended. And that's why it's important to understand what's the primary cause. Or maybe someone hurt your feelings or broke your heart. These are all common causes of anger. I'm just saying, guys, if you can identify the source of your anger, you're more likely to understand what you need to do to deal with it. Number two, learn to calm down before you react. Learn to calm down before you react. When you start to feel those emotions of anger rise up, and we do feel it, don't we? You know, it's like, it, it's like when, uh, when I start to get angry, I feel it from lower inside my gut, and it just begins to rise up. When you start to feel that emotion begin to rise up, take a few minutes to just step away, to walk away, to collect your thoughts. Self-talk. When you're trying to break a habit, self-talk can be so very effective. 
asking yourself, is it really worth getting this upset over? Will my anger really solve the problem? Will it really solve anything? You know, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 11 says, fools vent their anger, but the wise quietly hold back. In other words, think before you speak. Put your mind in gear before you put your mouth in motion. I once heard someone say, I've never regretted silence, but I've often regretted what I spoke. In James chapter 1, it says, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Guys, this is a great refrigerator verse. This is a great computer screen verse. This is one of those verses that you can put on your computer screen so that you see it every day. You must all be quick to listen. When you're an angry individual or struggling with the habit of anger, you don't want to listen to anybody. You you want to get in their face. And so be quick to listen and then slow to speak and slow to get angry. Number three, get some exercise. I mean, that, that, that's pretty simple. Just get some exercise. It helps. It really does to take a walk, to, to go to a gym, whatever you need to do to reduce your anger or stress level. You know, experts tell us that exercise helps to increase the release of endorphins in our body, which, are, which reduce the level of stress. So just go for a walk. Get some exercise. Number four, let go of my anger correctly. There's a lot that could be said about this one, and as I said, uh, I, I say more about it in the book, but just decide, uh, just decide that you're not going to handle your anger in inappropriate ways. For instance, don't repress your anger. What, what a lot of us do is that we just take that anger and we try to push it down inside. We try to repress it, and we think that's dealing with it. That's not dealing with it, because your anger is always going to find a way to be expressed. Did you know that? Your anger is always going to find a way to be expressed. So therefore, you might express it in sarcasm. Don't use sarcasm. Some of you think you're pretty witty with your sarcasm, but it's actually coming from repressed anger. Some of you try to manipulate to get your own way. And others of you have a vindictive spirit. I don't get mad. I just get even. Listen to me, friends. Whether you complain, blame, or criticize, people that are negative are usually trying to do what? They're usually trying to repress their anger. But anger will always find a way of release. I, I, I think about, you know, when someone gets electrocuted, they say that that electricity has to find an exit. It has to come out of their bodies, whether it's come through their fingers or whatever. It has to come out of their body. The same thing is true. When we try to repress our anger, it's not going to work. It has to find a way of release. By the way, Did you know that there's another word for repressed anger? It's called depression. Depression is frozen rage or repressed anger. And yet on the flip side, some of you say, like like my dad used to boast, he would say, well, you know, I'll never have any health problems because I I don't uh, push down my anger. I let it come out as if that was a good thing. You can't just go out and express your anger in violent or abusive reactions or verbal abuse. When you do... You leave burn marks on everyone that's in your path. One pastor said, we often act like a skunk. We spray our stinking temper on anyone that gets in our way. Number five, practice forgiveness. Jesus, as you know, was unjustly beaten and mocked. They placed a crown of thorns on his head. They nailed his hands and feet to a wooden cross. Guys, if anyone had a right to be angry, I think it was Jesus. And yet, do you remember what he said to them? He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. If you really want to get rid of your anger, you have to decide you're going to forgive the person who has done you wrong. You know, I've heard it said that holding on to forgiveness is like drinking rat poison, hoping that the rat will die. Forgiveness, and, and I don't want to chase a rabbit here, but forgiveness and unforgiveness can also become habits in your life. So if if you want to learn to forgive, you need to create the spiritual discipline of forgiveness. Make a decision today, I'm going to forgive this person. And you keep making that decision until it just becomes second nature to you. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, it says, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Lewis Smeads once said, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and then discover the prisoner was you. And yet forgiveness is a process. 
And while it takes time to let it go, while it takes time to break that old bad habit of unforgiveness, you can forgive that person that's wronged you. Number six, give your anger an expiration date. In Ephesians chapter four, Paul says, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. In other words, don't let a day go by without resolving your anger. When you allow angry emotions to accumulate over time, like a pressure cooker, they will eventually explode into destructive and inappropriate ways that are only going to hurt the people that you love. And it's going to leave you guys with all kinds of regrets. Number seven, rely on God's control. Listen, if you really believe that God has a plan for your life, you will experience contentment and peace. I want you to think about that for a minute. If you really believe that God has a purpose and a plan for your life, then you're going to experience contentment and peace because you'll stand between the pillars of goodness and control. You'll stand between the pillars that say that I know God's a good God, that he loves me and he wants the best for me. And I know that God's in control, that he has my back. And as long as I believe those two things, then I'm going to experience a peace that passeth all human comprehension. So whether you're struggling with worry or fear or whether you're struggling with anger, we need to, be, we need to step in between those two pillars and trust God. So maybe, you, maybe you've struggled. Maybe you find yourself and you say, maybe you didn't get the home you bid on. Maybe you're trying to buy a new home and you didn't get the home you bid on. So you want to get angry. You want to get upset. But then you realize, you know what? God has a plan for my life. I may not fully understand or comprehend what he's doing, but I do trust him. So there is really no reason for me to get upset because I know one way or another, he's promised to work all things together for my good. Listen, anger is not something you can prevent, but as long as it's not a habit, and as long as you keep it under control, friends, you will have more peace, you will have healthier relationships than you can ever imagine. I'm going to ask everyone, if you would, to bow your head for just a moment with every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around. I said to you just a few moments ago that before you could ever start working these steps to break this bad habit of anger, you had to own it. You had to acknowledge it. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is that I'm going to, every head is bowed, no one's looking around. This is just between you and God. But if you recognize that anger is a bad habit for you and you need to acknowledge and deal with it, I'm going to ask you just to raise your hand and then put it back down. Just raise your hand and then put it back down. Everywhere. Everyone that's listening. Okay. Let me pray for you. God, I just thank you and I praise you for your faithfulness. I thank you that you love us and I thank you that you want the best for us. And I pray now, God, today that as we acknowledge this anger in our life, that as we acknowledge that this has become a problem for us, I pray that you'd give us the motivation, that you'd give us the want to, to break this habit once and for all. That we would take the necessary steps, we would be intentional to take the steps to break this pattern in our life. God, we can't do it on our own. We absolutely need your help. And so would you give us the courage, would you give us the boldness to act and the strength to break this particular stronghold once and for all in our life? Thank you, God, that you love us and that you want the best for us. In Jesus' name, amen.
so much for joining us this week guys we hope that you know it's just been great um we we ask that you stick around for communion which will happen in just a moment but otherwise have a great week be blessed go out love well and just uh live for jesus Will you join me in communion? And today, before we do communion, 
we remember the Exodus. It's told in Exodus chapter 12, and we are reminded of the 10th plague out of 10 that Moses um, was involved in Egypt. I found an excerpt on the internet from Mary Fairchild, The Last Supper Bible Story Study Guide, and I'm going to share a couple of paragraphs from that. Passover commemorated Israel's hurried escape from bondage in Egypt. Its name derives from the fact that no yeast was used for cooking the meal. The people had to escape quickly, so they did not have time to let the bread rise. So the first Passover meal included unleavened bread. In the book of Exodus, the blood of the Passover lamb was painted on the Israelites' doorframe, causing the plague of the firstborn to pass over their houses. And it spared the firstborn sons from death. At the Last Supper... Jesus revealed that he was about to become the Passover lamb of God. By offering the cup of his own blood, Jesus shocked his disciples. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins, Matthew 26, 28. The disciples had only known of animal blood being offered in sacrifice for sin. This concept of Jesus' blood introduced a whole new understanding. No longer would the blood of animals cover sin, but the blood of their Messiah. The blood of animals sealed the old covenant between God and his people. The blood of Jesus would see the new covenant. The Last Supper became known as the Lord's Supper because of Paul's reference in 1 Corinthians 11.20. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper, that you eat. And we remember the Last Supper when Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Will you join me in prayer? Jesus, thank you for the example of the Passover and for the sacrifice that you made for us. In Jesus' name, amen.